wondered how this holy place could take a man like him with shouts of great rejoicing and with music in they came with the angels standing by him he asked what could be their name these are the company of prophets the goodly fellowship of souls who spake god's word with faith and boldness who bless the poor and made the wounded whole oh he fell upon his knees and cried i could not go with he waited till another band of shiny ones to Come on.
Let's go ahead and play soft. Get, here we go. Let's do it. Hello, one, two. Y'all pray for us today. We have had an explosion in our soundboard, they say, this morning. So uh, there's a, if you know anything about them, there's a bunch of slides at the bottom. Normally, you just control everything with those slides, and they're all dead. None of those are working at all this morning. So we may have some technical difficulties with the sound. They had some technical difficulties in California with their sound. That made me feel good, except that Brother Fisher handled it so wonderfully. He just kept laughing and saying, it's fine, we'll just sing it again. They sung a whole song with the duet, and one boy's mic didn't work. Brother Fisher said, let's sing it all again. He worked too hard not to let him let us hear him. And so they started to sing it the second time, and the girl's mic didn't work. He said, let's just do it again. They've worked too hard. And I was calling Marvin and yelling at him. I thought, sure, it's his fault. <laughs> Brother Fisher wasn't mad, but I was mad. I thought, somebody's got to get yelled at. Marvin, what are you doing? So... I'm not going to yell at Marvin this morning because Brother David broke the machine, we think, and uh, we're going to blame him. But give us a little uh, patience, if you would, with the sound system. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll ask the Lord to meet with us this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how good you are. We thank you, Lord, for loving us, for being good to us. We thank you for this place to come. Appreciate a good, warm building to meet in this morning with the temperature the way it is and uh, the weather the way it is. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us this place, and I appreciate all those that have come out in the cold this morning to come to church and try to hear from you, Lord, hear from heaven and I pray that you'd work on us today that you'd work in us and through us and Lord we pray that you'd be blessed in the service but also that your people that are here would be helped today in some special way I ask you to be with the singing Lord the singing of the choir has already touched my heart uh, Lord you said that this is what we should rejoice in not anything else except that our names are written down in heaven and so Lord those of us in here this morning that are saved by the grace of God and by the blood of Jesus we ought to be excited about that fact we ought to be able to rejoice if everything else was falling apart in our lives we ought to be able to rejoice in the fact that we know we have a better place and a better day coming. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be excited about that. Lord, forgive us for every sin. Empty our hearts this morning of anything that might hinder the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we'll praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have them sing a little bit of that song again. Uh, my heart was stirred. That is something that we can all rejoice in is that we are saved. That last one says, praise God, I've been redeemed from sin and shame. You ought to be thankful. If you've been saved, you ought to be thankful that you've been redeemed from sin and the shame of sin. Isn't that wonderful? Let's let them sing that, and then we'll do the rest with Brother Ken and everything else. together now what number you got 380. 380 in your hymn book let's rear back and sing it out for the Lord it is unto the Lord so give him your very best effort now if you're visiting with us this morning we appreciate you being here if you've never visited before or never gotten one of our visitor packets we want these fellas to give you one of those so while we're all turning to 380 they'll walk down the aisle and if you're visiting and never gotten one of these slip your hand up and let them give it to you you keep the things that are in it except the visitors card we'd like for you to fill that out let's rear back and sing Standing on the promises, standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring, glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises. 
that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing standing I'm standing on the of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Thank you, be seated. His birth was of a virgin. Some think his miracles can be explained away. Some say that he was just a good man. And even though he died, he wasn't really raised. Well, skeptics rise. And speak their lies. Offers. Faith has always had its noisy enemies. They may rise up, but only for a moment. Till we see the evidence through the centuries. Jesus Christ, the way.
to stand while the choir is coming down and shake hands with someone around you there. Thank God for truth. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thanks for being in church this morning. We appreciate that. Brother Ken's going to come and give you several announcements that a good portion of you won't listen to. So right before you stop listening, listen to this one. All right, everybody look at this one. We could have a Sunday where there is bad weather. That does happen from time to time. Uh, there are some Sundays where it snows, sometimes where it sleets, where there's ice or whatever the case may be. Uh, when that happens, we will still have a service of some sort here. Now, there are times that we only have a 10 o'clock service or we only have an 11 o'clock service on that Sunday morning, depending on if the weather's getting worse or if it's getting a little better throughout the day. You say, well, how are we supposed to know the difference? Well, there's a couple of ways. We do put it on the TV, on the local news and things. Ms. Stiles puts it on there for us and they'll announce that. But the best way is the church call. I will do a church call that morning to let you know. Miss Miranda, won't you just stand all the way up so they know for sure. Come on, stand up there. This is Miss Miranda, Brother Matt's wife. She handles, you can be seated, the church call numbers. If you don't get them, you say, well, I don't even know what they are, then you don't get them. So you need to come and see Miss Miranda after the service or sometime in the next, uh, this service or tonight or the next few services, or you could even call the church line through the week, 652-7505. Leave a message if she don't answer. If she does, it'll be my wife and uh, say I need to be put on that church call list. And what it is, is I can call a number and record a message and hit send and it goes to everybody that's on the list all at once. And uh, so if you do not get those church calls, you say, do you have to be a member? No, you do not. If you regularly come and you would need to know on that Sunday morning if we were going to have it at 10 or at 11 or whatever the schedule for that day was going to be, then uh, see Miss Miranda or call the church number and we'll get you on that list. All right? Now listen to the rest of these now. Man, we need to do this more often because everybody is really listening. Wow. All right. Um, this week, there's a lot of things going on. Um, on Thursday, we are having growth visitation at 6.30. And uh, plan on being here for that. We've got uh, cards printed up. Come up here and get some. Pass them out this week. Next week is Friend Day. Uh, looking forward to that. So keep that in mind. Brother Jason, come on up here, and he's going to talk about the public school revival, uh, which is next week. Good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. All right. A week from Wednesday, we'll start the teen revival. I'm excited about it. Uh, pray for us. This week, we'll be at all the public schools. I love, I love that we get to do this. And so, if you would, please be praying about it. You know, these invitations, and I tell the teenagers this, they look sharp. Brother Marvin does a good job on this. But, you know, this can either be just a piece of paper that we put in a teenager's hand, or we can ask the Holy Spirit to help it, that it's an invitation that they come and get saved next week, okay? So let's be praying about this. Please do that. And uh, so we'll kick off next, next Wednesday, okay? So it's a week from Wednesday. Now, one note I want to make about that is this. That service that night starts at 6 o'clock. So as you spread the word, I hope that you've been inviting somebody. As you spread the word about that, please let everybody know that Wednesday night service for the teen revival will start at 6 o'clock, okay? Uh, we will have the banners up this week. You'll see that. Those that are at the public school uh, will be handing out those flowers. So church, three things. Please pray about it. Please invite someone. I reach out to a lot of the local churches here in town. I coordinate with their pastors and their youth pastors about them bringing their churches. There is a couple of churches that cancel their Wednesday night service with the teenagers, and they bust them over here just for the teen revival. And that's a big deal. They don't have to do that. That's a, that is a blessing that they do that. So let's be praying about that. And then last thing is this, is we are giving away a four-wheeler this year, and I love that. I'm excited about that. The teenagers come like crazy for that. And uh, I'm looking to raise about $1,500. Some have already 
you're giving, and I really appreciate that. If you'd like to get in on the teen revival and give towards that, we would love to do that, okay? Church, I'm going to go preach right now up in the junior church, but Brother Josh will be down here. He's on the base, so if you'd love to give towards that, see him this morning or come see me tonight. Church, I love you. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and have our ushers come. Uh, while they're coming, next Saturday, this coming Saturday, uh, we're having a prison service down at the Little Prison, and you have to be there at 6 o'clock. Please plan on uh, coming and being a part of that service, and uh, we're going to bring a meal. We do this every year, done this for many years. Um, you can drop that off at the school during the day, all day Saturday. The school will be open, and you can put some food in there in the cafeteria, and then uh, Miss Kelly is going to... Uh, organize it and get it to the prison uh, by six o'clock. And if you are planning on making some food, um, tell Miss Kelly so that she kind of knows how much is going to be being prepared. And then if you are planning on uh, going to the service, just bring it with you to the service. Please uh, let her know if you are going to pre be preparing some food. And then uh, two weeks from tonight, it will be the last Sunday of February, we are going to take up our first missions trip offering. Uh, when we go out of the country, we take up these offerings um, at the last Sunday of every month. So keep that in mind, uh, these things coming up. Be praying about these things. Be praying for that prison service. There, there's about 90 or so prisoners in that. And uh, each year when we have this meal, almost the entire uh, group comes. Almost every man in the camp will come. And they come probably, m many of them come for the food. And, you know, that's fine. Praise the Lord for that. But they hear the gospel while they're there. So be praying about that. And, of course, the public school revival as well. Uh, we have families in our church now because their teens wanted to come to that public school revival. And then they, eventually the whole family started coming. So be praying for these things. Also be praying for Brother Johnny Flynn and his family. His cousin passed away. This was a, a cousin that he was very close to growing up. And so uh, they're having the funeral, receiving friends from 2 to 4, and the funeral at 4 at Mumford Cove Church. And uh, also pray for our special citizens, uh, one of our family faithful special citizens James been coming for I don't know probably 30 years he's been coming he passed away and brother Nick will be doing a graveside service for him at two o'clock in Morganton so they're not having a, a full funeral just going to do the graveside so pray for brother Nick on that and pray for these families and uh, just ask the Lord to help them all right let's pray for the offering father thank you for the privilege to give thank you that you have given to us and made it possible that we might give back I pray that we would be faithful in that we appreciate you how you've been blessing pray that you continue to multiply the offerings Lord we thank you for uh, influence how that you've given us influence around the world and we're trying to increase that so that we might fulfill the great commission so Lord give us wisdom how to use this money to see more people saved than ever before in this year but we believe you're coming soon and we don't want to do less we want to do more as your day approaches so bless us in that way be with all these prayer requests we pray for the sick Lord we haven't mentioned them really today but we got a long list of those that are fighting sickness and cancer and have had surgeries and awaiting test results and all those things we pray that you'd bless each one and we'll praise you for it in Jesus name amen now if you're visiting with us we don't expect you to give in the offering but we'd love for you to put the visitor card in there if you filled that out God bless you She, was, uh, she had stepped out when Brother Kim was making that announcement, but just in case you didn't know, if you want to help with the prison food, you talk to Miss Kelly. Raise your hand, Miss Kelly. And that is my mother-in-law right there, Miss Kelly. Now, she told me this morning that she had been speaking to Brother Arnold. Brother Arnold and his wife have been with us now for several months, and uh, he, he, she was telling me that Brother Arnold told her that he could tell that I loved her. 
And she said, well, don't you hear all that stuff he says about me? And Brother Arnold told her, gave her great wisdom. He said, uh, now he wouldn't say all that if he didn't love you. And I said, he's exactly right. And I'm just going to keep loving on you in public every chance I get. So, so you can expect more of that love to come flowing. As a matter of fact, I'm going to Google this afternoon, mother-in-law joke so I can publicly love on her tonight right here in front of everybody. That's Miss Kelly. She'll help you with the prison food. You love me, don't you? I know you do. Amen. My wife loves you too. And I love you too. All right, I love you too. 1 Samuel 16, I need to give you two places to turn to. 1 Samuel 16 and, and the book of 3 John. If you go to Revelation and come back just a couple of pages, you'll find 3 John right near Revelation. And we're going to start in 1 Samuel 16, then we'll end in 3 John. Right before they sing, let me give you another, prayer, another uh, announcement here. I had Miss Miranda stand a minute ago. I won't have her stand again. You should remember who she is. Who she is. She has taken over handling uh, meals for ladies that have had surgery and for ladies that have uh, had babies. And uh, so if you'd like to help with that, and we need some ladies to help with that. Uh, in the past, we've had just a few ladies do all the work. And so if we could get some help, that would be a blessing. Come and talk to her. And then right in front of her is my wife, Becca, and she handles the, uh, now the food for funerals. A lot of times if it's somebody in our church or even kin to somebody in our church, we will offer to provide a meal for the family right at the day of the funeral, somewhere around there. And my wife kind of helps line all that up. So some of you ladies, if you would, after the service, come over and see them and say, look, if, if you need help you know, preparing this or preparing that for a funeral or for a lady that's having surgery, or whatever the case may be, I'd like to get in on it. This is the kind of thing you can do to be a blessing. This is a church in action for our own church body. And so get involved in that if you can. 1 Samuel 16 and the book of 3 John. Listen to the good song. The door is open, come on in. All you need to bring is what remains of your heart. I see the years of fear and pain on your face. Take a step, enter in. You are safe in this place. You're never too broken to belong. truth in that song amen I'm still believer in whosoever will may come and there's 
there's nothing you can do that'll make the Lord not willing to receive you. You can come to Him. I heard another song that talks about the church, and it says, it's an interesting thought goes along that. It says, nobody's too bad to come in, which means anybody can come to church. Say amen right there. Then it says, but also nobody's too good to stay out. Nobody, there's nobody in the world that don't need the Lord because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I am thankful that there's nobody so bad that he wouldn't take them. Amen. And you ought to thank God for that as well. 1 Samuel 16, thanks for praying this week. There was a lot of things that went on the last week or so. Last Sunday I was not here. Me and Brother Steve were in San Diego at a church uh, conference for the week. But that Sunday morning I preached at a little church outside of San Diego and then uh, preached actually preached three times to them. He wanted me to do a Sunday school workers meeting right before Sunday school. It was a short one. And then, then I did the Sunday school hour and then his uh, main morning service. And then we drove to San Diego to Brother Fisher's church. I preached there Sunday night. And then uh, actually on, uh, I guess it was either Sunday or Saturday night late, they texted me and asked me if I'd preach to the Spanish as well at Fisher's on Sunday night. So I ended up preaching five times that day. Preached the English service and immediately following preached to the Spanish and, uh, you know, it's kind of neat preaching to the Spanish because you don't really know what that other guy's saying. And so uh, I hope he just preaches what the Lord lays on his heart. And it doesn't even matter what I say. That'd be wonderful. I did say in the middle of it, I, I told Brother David a while ago, I said, I was trying to make a point. And I said, you know, I'm a country boy. And when I said that, he, he got stuck. I guess they don't have a, a way to say that. I don't know. Or maybe it doesn't mean the same thing. He kind of got stuck. And, and I was looking over at him. He's standing right here. I'm standing right here. And, and I'm looking at him and, and some different people. The pastor kind of through an option and somebody else from the crowd that could understand English kind of gave him a choice and finally he said a word and they all laughed. I said, what'd you just call me? And he kind of, he didn't even say, he never did tell me. I said, well, I wish I could talk to them and you didn't know what I was saying. I'd show you, praise God. So it's a little nerve-wracking preaching when you can't understand what the guy's saying. But the Lord did end up helping us there. Then I preached a couple more times in the conference and uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful week. And then came straight home and flew through the Red Eye flight Wednesday night. And got home Thursday morning and uh, went straight to the couples retreat. And I want to say it was a blessing. And uh, if you thought about going and then backed out at the end, man, you missed a blessing. Uh, that uh, Friday night, it was like church in there. We were crying and rejoicing and shouting. And the Lord moved in. And boy, the messages Brother Fleur brought and his wife spoke to the ladies. I don't know what all she said, but his part was wonderful. And I want to thank the Lord for that and thank those of you that prayed about all those things. And thank the Lord for his safety and all the traveling and everything this week. All right, 1 Samuel 16, we're going to read verse 7. <clears throat> it's good to be saved. Sure. I watched live stream the services last Sunday because it's a three-hour difference. So we were in the hotel when y'all were having church both the morning and the evening. And then Wednesday night as well, we watched all the services. It was funny. Brother Charlie Tinsley was funny in here Wednesday night. If you were not in here, uh, you missed it. And I saw him. He said, I, I want to try this. Brother Tony does it all the time. And, he said, it's good to be saved. And they said, sure. And he goes, man, that's awesome. <laughs> he, he tickled me. And then he told everybody I was from Kentucky, North Carolina. <laughs> I don't exactly know where that is, but it means a lot in his heart. Bless him. He gets one of those bless his hearts, you know, that we give them in the South when you really want to say something bad, but you just put bless their heart at the end. First Samuel 16, verse 7. The Bible said, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege to be in church. Thank you for the liberty that we have in the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that we can... I have church all week like we've been in some of us. And Lord, I thank you for that. Thank you for the answered prayers this week. I think about Miss Oaks and how you helped uh, with that one this past week. We praise you for that. And thank you, Lord, for the babies that have been born lately, that you've given healthy babies to us. We praise you for that. Thank you, Father, for uh, Miss Jim, uh, Brother Jim and Miss Mary and their good reports and medical tests that they got this week. Lord, just multiple places that you answered our prayers. Lord, many souls that were saved last Sunday and the good spirit that was here in those services and the spirit that was with us in California and then at the couples retreat, Lord, we ask you for all these things, and you have answered them, and we thank you for it. But we pray that you'd help us again now in this preaching time. You would speak to us, you would challenge us, that you would help us. And Lord, I pray that you would remove everything that is a uh, hindrance in me. Lord, remove all that is flesh and that is pride, and help me to be a, a vessel that the Spirit of God can flow through today. Thank you for the good singing now, and bless the preaching in Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Now, over the last week or so, because of the Valentine holiday, the world has been infatuated with the heart. 
Uh, many of you have received these things. We give heart-shaped balloons. We give heart-shaped candy. I saw a guy, somebody put it, I think, on Twitter. It was a preacher. His wife had given him a heart-shaped pizza. Say amen right there. Uh, that's pretty good stuff. And uh, there have been millions of notes written, and on the notes would be uh, hearts drawn. And the word heart, I love you with all my heart. You are in my heart. Uh, you know, all those different things. The heart has been the center of everyone's attention over the last few days. It reminds me of a story that I read not long ago. It said there was a very wealthy man who was having heart problems. Eventually, I had to go to the hospital, and the doctor looked at him and said, you're going to have to have a heart transplant. Now, this man was pretty wealthy, and he said, well, uh, doctor, he said, do you have any available? Money is no object. And the doctor said, well, it's kind of, it's kind of strange because normally we don't. He said, but right now we actually have three. And he said the first one was a, a teenager that was a prof almost professional level swimmer, a tremendous body, tremendous health, but had a tragic accident in the pool and died. And uh, that heart is $100,000. And said, we have another one as a 25-year-old marathon runner. Said, this, this man's never put anything bad in his body. He's always eaten right. He's trained his whole life. Said, he's probably got one of the strongest hearts you could ever imagine. And said, that heart is 150,000. Said, we have one more. A man's about 55 years old. Had been a heavy drinker, cigar smoking, steak lover. And said, he died and his heart is 500,000. Well, that wealthy man stopped, scratched his head for me. Said, well, why in the world is his heart so expensive when he lives such a terrible life? The doctor said, well, because he was a lawyer, so his heart's hardly been used. <laughs> it's, brand, it's practically brand new. <laughs> if there's any lawyers in here, amen. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Praise the Lord for that. I was with Brother Gibbs, David Gibbs this week. He's a lawyer. He's a great man. And so the heart is on everybody's mind, even when it's not Valentine's. Think about this. The world gives uh, great emphasis to the heart. We'll describe, uh, uh, you'll see a special on TV about a, a great philanthropist, somebody that gives money to the needy and, and gives things and builds buildings and all this stuff. And people will say, boy, they have a tender heart or a kind heart. You'll be watching sports or some kind of sporting event, a ball game of some kind, and if there's a fierce competitor, somebody that just won't ever quit and just won't ever give up, they'll say, boy, they have great heart or they play with great heart and you'll see a, a great soldier some uh, read some documentary or read some story or watch a documentary on some great war hero and they'll say buddy they have a courageous heart or a warrior's heart we often describe kind people as having a good heart they say ladies are sometimes when they're looking for a husband looking for a man with a tender heart we see the hateful people and we say they have a cold heart and so on and on and on even outside of this week of February the 14th, we are infatuated, if you will, with the heart. We talk a lot about it. We think a lot about it. I want you to know this morning that God cares about the heart as well. Right here in our text, you've got uh, Samuel the prophet has come to deal with Saul the king. And Saul has sinned and, and God is upset at him. And so... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Saul messed up and, and God has rejected him and now he has sent Samuel to anoint the new king. Now, all of us know that it's going to be David, but Samuel didn't know that, but he knew what house he was sent to and so uh, the sons of Jesse are beginning to be brought forth and that first one come out and he was a soldier, we know that, and big and strong and uh, the Bible said that when Samuel looked at him uh, that he thought surely at the end of verse 6, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. He said, in other words, this has got to be it. And by, and by the way, in Bible days, typically it would have been the oldest son that would have been chosen something like this and so Samuel was going along with tradition and then also with what his eyes saw if you know about King Saul here, you know that when he was chosen, he was a large man, head and shoulders above everybody else. And so probably Samuel is thinking about that as well. And he looks at this guy and he looks on the outside and says, surely this is the one the Lord is going to choose to be the king. And you've probably read this verse. I remember this week, uh, I think before I left town, I stopped in the school and, and Brother Stephen Kidd's boy Mason in our probably first grade class, I believe it is, he stopped and let me say my Bible verse to you. And he quoted this verse and he ended, it ends up saying, but the Lord... Lord looketh on the heart. And so Samuel looked on the outside and God rebuked him and said, no, you're looking at it all wrong. When I'm choosing my man, I'm not going to look at it the way the world does. I'm not just going to pick the biggest, not just going to pick the strongest, not going to pick the smartest always. Say amen right there. We're thankful for that. But he says, I'm going to look at the heart. And so God cares about the heart a great deal. In Psalm 7 verse 9 and Proverbs 17 verse 3 and 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 4, the Bible says that God God trieth our hearts. 
That God's not just looking at the heart in this situation when he's choosing a king, but that he regularly comes along in our lives and he tries or he tests or he examines our heart. Listen, God cares about the shape of your heart. And by the way, God knows about it. You can fool many, but you cannot fool God. God's looking past what we say. God's looking past what we wear. God's looking past even how we act. Now, he cares. Let me say this. He does care about all that. The Bible said in this verse that man looks on the outward appearance. And so the example and the influence that we have in this world, much is going to be based on the outward because man cannot see my heart. But listen, God, it isn't that God doesn't care about those things. Other scriptures teach us that he does. But I will say this, he's not fooled by those things. And God can look past what we say and past how we look and past how we act and he looks straight into the heart and he knows exactly what's in there. And so the Bible said in three different places, God trieth our hearts. God cares about the heart a great deal. God commands us in Proverbs 4.23 on Wednesday nights, some of our memory verses, this is one of them. He says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep meaning like guard your heart, protect your heart. That's why we do preach. That's why we do teach about that you should be careful what kind of things you watch and what kind of things you listen to and, and what kind of people you're around because uh, you know it can corrupt your mind and get into your heart and that God wants us to keep it or guard it. And then it said, keep the heart with all diligence. You say, well, what does that part mean? That means you got to keep doing it. That means, look at me, you don't just do it when you're young. It's not just for teenagers. It's not just for our kids to keep their heart you got to keep protecting your heart all throughout your life. you got to keep guarding your heart. You say, well, I'm older now. I'm past all that. No, you're never past sin. Listen to me now. We're never past messing up our lives. If you start looking in the Bible, as a matter of fact, most of the Bible characters, particularly in the Old Testament, that messed up, messed up later in life. David was older, and all of his wars were about over when he finally sinned with Bathsheba. The Bible says about Solomon, who was the wisest man that ever lived, it said that near the end of his life, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. Solomon had walked with God. He had talked with God and been and very wise in his request to God. And the Bible said God gave him a wise heart. But when he was old, you know what he did? He let down his guard a little bit. One of the things God had said to the king was, don't multiply to yourself wives. Solomon forgot that rule, and he had tons of wives. And he also broke the rule that he brought wives from other nations to himself. And when he was old, you need to take note of that, not when he was a teenager, not when he was in his 20s, when he was old, the Bible said they turned his heart away and he started worshiping false gods. We talked about Noah just the last couple of weeks and you know what we found out? When Noah was younger and Noah was growing up in that wicked world before the flood, that God found grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He lived a righteous life. He was different than the whole world. And then he saved his family through the flood. And then after the flood, Noah's older now. And what does he do? He lets up a little bit. And he ends up sinning and hurting his children. I want to say something to you. Keep thy heart. Guard thy heart with all diligence. You say, well, we don't have to worry about it much in our marriage because we've been married for 20 or 30 years. No, no, no. You've got to keep it with all diligence. They're divorcing like crazy now that have been married 30 years. They're divorcing all over the place that have been married 25 years, 28 years, 35 years. You say, why would they do that? Because they're not guarding their heart. They let up when they got a little older because they thought we're past that kind of temptation. Oh, no, we're not. And the Lord knows that. So he says, keep the heart with all diligence. And here's why he said that. For, that means because, if you will, out of it, out of your heart, keep the heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Your whole life is affected by your heart. My whole life is affected by my heart and the things that are in my heart and the spiritual condition of my heart. Listen to me now. See, our words come from our heart. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The Lord said, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Out of it come our words. Our words that hurt people come out of our heart. Our heart's a mess. We've got to be careful about our heart because it, the issues of life come out of it. Our words come out of it. Our ways come out of it. Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You want to know what kind of heart you have? How do you, how do you act? 
For as he is in his heart, so is he. Our words come from our heart, out of the abundance of heart, the mouth speaketh. But our ways come from our heart. That hateful person, that he has a hateful heart. That uh, listen, that thief, he, he has a wicked heart. That liar, he has a deceitful heart. We got to watch. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. God says this heart is going to affect everything in your life. Our words come from here. Our ways come from here. Our worship comes from here. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 17, he was telling the children of Israel, he said, But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away, and worship other gods and serve them. He said, if you're not careful, the, these, these evil nations around you are going to turn your heart, and when they do, you won't worship right anymore. You'll worship these false gods instead of worshiping me. I read you the verse about Solomon. You know what it said? Look at me now. It said that his wives turned away his heart so that he worshiped them false gods. The heart affects your words. And out of our heart comes our ways. And out of our heart comes our worship. And you say, well, you know, I don't know. Something's wrong with the church. It just doesn't feel like it used to feel. And man, the spirit just doesn't seem to, you know, maybe it's not always the church. And I know sometimes it is us. Sometimes it's me. Sometimes it's the choir. But listen, sometimes it might be your heart. You ought to be able to worship all by yourself. You ought to be able to worship in your car from time to time, at your home from time to time, somewhere else from time to time. Listen, it's not always somebody else's fault. He said your heart will get turned away and you won't worship anymore. That's why it's so important to keep the heart with all diligence, all diligence, all the time guarding your heart, watching your heart, being careful what you see, being careful what you hear, being careful who you're around, being careful to guard, keep thy heart because our words come from it, our ways come from here, our worship come from, comes from here, and listen, our wickedness comes from here. You say, oh, no, 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 that, we got a good heart. No, you don't. Now, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit living in your heart, and he's good. But my heart, that's where all my wickedness comes from. You Well, the devil made me do it. Probably not. I'm probably not important enough for the devil to focus his attention on. I'm probably not doing enough for the cause of Christ that he would stop bothering the people who are really doing the work of God to come and bother me. By the way, the devil can't be everywhere at once like God can. So it's probably not the devil made me do it. Most of the time, my wickedness comes from my own heart, and so does yours. And the Bible says in Mark, Jesus said in Mark 7, verse 21 to 23, for from within, out of the heart of men, listen to what he said, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, listen to this list, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within, from our heart. Why? Well, I just don't think, I, I just don't think. No, no, listen, the problem is we think too highly of ourselves and we forget that we are wicked flesh and that anything good that's ever been in us or come out of us is because the Holy Spirit that lives there or just the grace of God that's working on us and in us. And so we need to understand that the heart is a very big deal to God. And it's a big deal to God because he knows how much influence and power it has in our lives. And so God says, keep thy heart with all diligence. That's why he says right here that man looks on the outside, but I'm looking at your heart. You know why? He's not trying to pick on us. He's not looking at our heart so he can be mean to us. He's looking in our heart because he wants to help us. And he knows that the condition of our heart can determine everything else in our life. Our words come from it. Our ways come from it. Our worship comes from it. Our wickedness comes from it. And God knows the power and the influence our hearts have on us, so he cautions us to guard it with all diligence. Now, with that in mind, I want to take the last few minutes, just a couple more minutes, to speak to you about this, the greatest heart disease man can have, and it is pride. The greatest heart disease man can have is pride. Nothing causes more trouble in our lives like pride in our heart. And let me, go ahead and just, let me go ahead and just help all of us. We all have it. Well, I'm not a bit prideful. There you go. That, wasn't, that didn't take long, did it? Don't tell me I'm prideful. I am not. If you wasn't, I just ruined you. Sorry about that. We all, look at me, we all have it. The children have it. It doesn't take long for uh, little boys to be on the bus. I, 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 little boys get around each other on the playground, whatever the case may be. And, and maybe on the playground you see them start competing. And boy, I'm the best or I want to be the best and I'm better than you. And then pretty soon it's, it's uh, my daddy's better than your daddy. You ever heard them conversations? 
I heard about uh, three boys. One of them was a preacher's kid. And the first kid said, they started talking about that, talking trash. Finally, one of them said, well, I'll tell you what, my daddy's a, he said, my daddy is, uh, is amazing. He said, my daddy wrote a few words on a piece of paper and they called it a poem. Somebody gave him $50 for it. That other kid said, well, that's something. My daddy wrote several pages of words. They called it a story. Somebody gave him $100 for his. That preacher's kid said, my daddy wrote some words down, stood up in church and said them. It took six or seven men to carry all the money. <laughs> then a head jerk right there. One man, one boy said, my daddy's the president of the local bank. That other boy said, well, my daddy owns two or three of the grocery stores in town. That preacher's kid shook his head and said, y'all ain't got nothing on my daddy. He said, my daddy owns hell. He said, what? He said, yeah, I heard him telling my mama that the deacons gave it to him the other night. <laughs> Not our deacons. Amen. That wasn't me. If Cooper said that, I'd slap his teeth out of his mouth. Pride. You know what? Everybody's got it. Oh, that's just kids. No, no, no. That's just kids revealing what's in their heart. Ms. Stiles has uh, uh, said for years that, that uh, watching these kids grow up in our Christian school and everything she said you watch it uh, she calls me uh, brother Tony she said you watch it brother Tony she said uh, two girls can be friends but if there's just three girls there's always going to be a problem yeah. you know why that is pride and girls are crazy both both of those <laughs> pride everybody's got it you have it the best thing you could do today is stop and say you know I got it I can't tell you how often I repent of it Almost every day. Almost every day. Actually, I should every day. I just might forget some days. But I'm telling you, I deal with it. You can't help it. You go and preach. Uh, uh, Brother Andrew Decker is a young friend of ours from Ohio, and he's been coming to our youth meetings for years. And, and Brother Andrew's doing some, he's doing a lot of the preaching right now. If y'all think to pray for Bible, Bible believers in Ohio, their pastor's real sick, and Andrew might be kind of moving into place to be the next pastor. And so Andrew came out to California with, with us last year and again this year. And, and this year, uh, he was walking with me. I was showing him something around the place. And while we were walking, he said, is it, is it harder to preach here than it is some other places? And I said, well, I said, one of the things that makes it tougher in this meeting is the people sitting out in the pews. When I preach to those men, there's many, many pastors out there that are older than me, that I consider smarter than me and better than me. And that makes it a little, little more intimidating. And, you know, I think... I think part of that's okay, but another part of that is the flesh starts saying, boy, I, I hope I impress them. See, you want to preach something that they go, ooh, I never thought of that, or oh, I didn't never see that, and you have to kill that because you understand that's, if I'm trying to impress man, you know what that is? Pride. If I care more about what they think, I, I had these thoughts, well, I, well, I don't know if I ought to preach that here because if I preach that here, so-and-so might not believe like that and so-and-so might not believe like that and, and if they hear me, they might not ever have me come preach at their place. And Isn't that crazy? I preach enough places. I don't need new places. You say, what is that? You know what it is. The fear of man bringeth a snare. And that fear of man or that trying to impress man, it's say the word. You know what it is? And it's in my heart because I'm flesh like everybody else. You say, well, I can't believe you're telling us that. Well, I, I just need you to understand that everybody's got it. Now, what I try and do by the grace of God is when those thoughts come, I try and kill them immediately. I say, oh, Lord, I know I shouldn't have had that thought. That's flesh. That's pride. Lord, I pray you forgive me for that. As long as you're pleased, Lord, that's all that matters. And by the way, that's the truth. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks about what I preach as long as the Lord liked what I said. As long as I know as best I could, I said what he wanted me to say. I said it in the right spirit. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks as long as he's pleased. But it hadn't always been like that in my heart. I remember when I taught Sunday school out here and I would come down and lead the congregation. Becca would jump in the car with me out after my Sunday school class and we had rushed down here. One week she parked right behind me and uh, I jumped in my car and said, come on, hurry. And I backed my car into her car, wrecked both of our cars on the same day. And then had to come down here and sing, victory in Jesus. I wreck my cars. I hate all of you. That's what I want to say. <laughs> Couldn't do that. So she'd get in the car every week, and I'd say, you know, I'd start cranking up, and I'd say, well, you know, well, well, how, how do you think that went? That lesson I just did, that truth I just brought you from the Bible. Now, you understand, if she ever would have said, you sounded like a moron today. If she ever would have said that, I would have, I would have just quit preaching probably, you know. If she ever would have said, I, I really tried, Tony, but I couldn't understand anything you were saying. Or, sorry, I, I fell asleep four times. I don't know what you said. 
<laughs> this is the honest truth. I was in that. I was in this. I hope. Well, it's live stream. We'll just go for it. I was uh, preaching in Australia not long ago, and. Uh, the day before I got there, another preacher had preached, an American missionary had preached, and we were all sitting in this room just fellowshipping, that guy that had preached and some other men. And he's sitting there, and he says to a fellow across the room, he says, Brother Justin, he said, Brother Justin, I'm looking for some feedback on that message I preached to the teens this morning. He says, do you think it was over their head, or do you think they understood okay? Because, you know, sometimes it is hard to know. And this guy, I don't think he was pridefully searching here. I think he was honestly asking the question. And so he says, do you think it was over their head? And Brother Justin goes, uh, uh, well, I was out a whole lot. I, I had to go out a bunch. And everybody was kind of like, oh, this is awkward. And finally he said, I was having some stomach issues. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, okay. And he, but uh, while I was in there, it was really good. <laughs> I thought, well, you didn't want to tell him that you didn't care. Well, I slept and left twice. Just to be honest with you, it was horrible. Uh, I used to do that with Becca, and you know why? I wanted her to say it was good. And then one day I got in the car, and I said, hey, what would you think? How would you like that? And it's like the Holy Spirit said, what does it matter if anybody liked it as long as you did what I told you to do? I mean, it was a slap down is what it was. He said, what if nobody liked it? And it was still what I told you to do. Is that not enough? Hmm. And I said, well, Lord, first of all, it's not fair when you do that. <laughs> but you're right. And I just made it a rule by the grace of God. I just don't ask her. You want to. You still want to. There are times I still catch myself from time to time when I, when I preach one and I just I didn't feel like it went good or didn't feel like it came out right or didn't feel like it, I was able to articulate it the way I wanted to. You, you just fish a little like, did that make sense? And You think, you know, and the Holy Spirit saying, you're trying to impress people. You know what that is, don't you? Say the word. All right, I see that we're a couple minutes after. Look over at 3 John. By the way, you know what? Every time, listen to me now, we're only going to go a couple of minutes here in 3 John. 3 John only has one chapter. We'll look at verse 9. Every time there is contention in our life, contention is a strife or a struggle, a problem. Every time there is contention in our lives, it is because of pride. Not sometime, not every now and then. The Bible said in Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride cometh contention. But with the well-advised there is wisdom. Only by pride. We're King James Bible believers we believe every word's in their own purpose. So when the Bible says only by pride, the Holy Spirit meant only by pride. So that means when there's contention in your home, it's because of pride. And usually, by the way, it's pride in both. If there's a problem between parents and a child, if there's, if there's a division, if there's some kind of separation or some kind of a, a schism, as the Bible says, between people, you know what? There's pride somewhere, if not on both sides. When there's a contention at work, I just can't stand so-and-so. They drive me crazy over there. You know what? Somewhere in that is pride. It might be in them. might be in you. But the Bible said there is pride somewhere because only by pride cometh contention. And God says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And one of the worst things for our heart, everybody say the word, is... Here in 3 John, verse 9, look at it. I wrote unto, thee, I wrote unto the church... But Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Now, I want to show you just a couple of things very quickly from this man here who let pride get in his heart, and it hurt the cause of Christ, and it hurt the church of Christ. Diotrephes. I want you to see the stating of the problem in verse 9. The apostle simply writes, He loveth to have the preeminence. The preeminence. The word preeminent means this, above or superior to others. Above or before others or superior. So here's a man that has got it in his heart that he loves to be above everybody. He loves to be before everybody. He loves to be superior to everybody. And you've got to picture this in your mind. Along to this little congregation comes John and some of the others. They've got this little congregation here. And uh, into this little congregation, inside it is this man, Diotrephes, that has been given some kind of authority, some kind of position. He has a great amount of influence and he has fell in love with that. 
And so now here comes John. Can you imagine if you had some authority in a congregation and you saw a man coming and it was John? You know, Peter, James, and John. John, the one that laid on the bosom of Jesus. John, who was closer to the Lord, went all the way to the cross. John, who was given the personal care of Mary, the mother of Jesus, that John. So picture this in your mind. You, you're in a congregation and you have some authority and in comes a visit, if you will, or in comes a letter from John. Well, you know what would happen if you have any pride. You'd automatically be intimidated. You'd automatically get defensive because you'd start thinking, oh boy, if John comes in here, they're all going to follow John. I mean, John walked with Jesus and John loved Jesus better than anybody and John's been living with the mother of Jesus and so that's what happens here. There's this man and he's got pride in his heart. He wants to be the center of attention. He wants the credit. He has a prideful heart. Let me show you the symptoms of the problem. We're almost done. The stating of the problem is he loveth to have the preeminence. He wants to be before and above superior. And John says, look at verse 10 again, Wherefore if I come, I, or verse 9, excuse me, But Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Picture that now. He's got authority in this little church here. And John and some of the brethren come, or even maybe new Christians are coming, and Diotrephes starts thinking, I'm going to lose my authority. Now, some of us have seen this. Some of us have seen it in a church. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and say there's a lot of churches that struggle with this. There's a lot of churches that when God begins to bless and new people begin to come, trouble starts coming up in certain people's hearts because they start thinking they might lose their preeminence. I might lose my position. Some of you that grew up maybe in little country churches might have seen this some. I've certainly seen it. I know preachers have certainly had to deal with it. I talk with them. I counsel with them uh, regularly where they, they come into a place and they're just pouring their heart into it and there's 25 or 30 or 35 people to begin with. That preacher gets in there and he's knocking on doors and, and he's uh, winning souls and he's getting people in and boy, people start coming. And By the way, when people start getting saved and start coming in, they don't always look just like we want them to look and they don't always act just like we want them to act because by the way, they just got saved, which means they're a baby in Christ. They don't always say everything just like they ought to say it. And by the way, they also don't know the assigned seats. And so God forbid that they come in and they just take their family and sit all over those people's seats. And all of a sudden, diatrophies rises up in their heart. What are they doing? We've been sitting here for 830 years. My family, my family carved this wooden bench with their own hands from wood made from the ark itself. Now we're laughing, but y'all know it's that real. Y'all know that family that's been in charge their whole life when some new folks start coming in and growth starts happening. God forbid that the new pastor asks somebody else to be over some new project pretty soon. If you're not careful, diatrophies rises up in us. I'm trying to say to you, we all have it, and pride will destroy our heart. And it destroys a good church. It destroys a home. It can destroy businesses. So the first symptom we see is this, is that the, the prideful heart covers insecurity with isolation. In verse 9 it says, He receiveth us not. So what happens is, I don't want to lose my position, and so I just don't allow anything new to come in. I don't allow anybody new to come in. We talked about the young girls that have two friends but can't have three friends. Three friends. So you got the two, and they've been best friends forever, and it's always just been the two of them, and then a third one comes in or somehow gets put on the scene, and if you're not careful, uh, one of the others starts thinking, I'm going to lose my best friend. And so what they do, they exclude that third one. They refuse to receive that third one. Now that is pride. And by the way, that's not just children. Mamas are pretty bad about inflicting this on the children, and we adults are bad about this where we work and what we do. You got to be careful. Hey, you know, you've been in that business for 20 years. You've been in that company for 25 years, and, and, and you deserve this and you deserve that. And all of a sudden, this young, uh, successful hotshot starts coming up the ranks, and people start to promote him, and people start to bring him up. And then, pretty soon, if you're not careful, all of a sudden, you start thinking, wait a minute. This guy's rising up pretty fast. He may be going to take what I got. So, you know what you do if you ain't careful? You refuse to receive him. The insecurity is covered by isolation. We'll just, if we keep it out and keep it just like it is, then I get to stay where I'm at. Pride will destroy you. Listen now. 
Pride's a killer. Covers insecurity with isolation. Just two more things. It creates status by slandering. Look at verse 10. Verse 10, he says, He prating against us with malicious words. So here's what happens next. I think you can see it if you're really looking in your mind. You got that new person coming into the group. You got this guy thinking they're going to lose their position. So at first, they don't want to receive them. So how do they keep them out of the group? Well, they got to start pointing out all their flaws. Oh, we better not receive her. Let me tell you what I heard about her. Hey, we better not, uh, we better be careful about him. Let me tell you what I heard about him or what I saw or what I read. This is, by the way, this is all over the internet, isn't it? Facebook, Twitter, and all that stuff. Drives me crazy when you read. I don't do Facebook. I, I do Twitter. and I get crazy on Twitter when I see preachers do this. They'll put something on there like this. They'll say, don't you hate it when certain people, blah, 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 blah. Now, everybody that reads that knows you don't mean certain people. You mean a certain person. And then everybody either wants to find out who that certain person is or many of your buddies already know who it is. So you're just prating against them with malicious words. And you know why we usually do that? To make sure we stay up where we're supposed to be. It's killer. It's killer. It happens at all levels of our society. It happens with our young people. It happens with us adults. It happens in church. It happens at work. It happens at school. It happens in society. It happens everywhere because we all have pride. That's why God said you got to keep your heart with all diligence because this is always going to crop back up and you got to kill it. You've got to pray and ask God by His grace and with the blood of Jesus to remove those things from your heart and from your mind. So first of all, it covers insecurity with isolation. It don't want to receive them. And then it creates status by slandering others. I, I, I can keep them out if I tell everybody the bad stuff about them. And the last thing is this. In verse 10, it controls influence with intimidation. Look at verse 10 again. Not only, he says, and not content therewith. In other words, he didn't receive us, and he talked bad about us, but that wasn't even enough. Look what he does. He goes one step further, and boy, you've seen this. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would. All right, so I'm not going to receive them. And you know what? I forbid you to receive them. And look what it says after that. And casteth them out of the church. He says, I am not going to receive these guys. And here I'll tell you why. Because they're wicked. Because of this. He starts speaking those malicious words. And then he says, and furthermore, if I find out that any of you have received them, then you're out. So he is, look now. He's keeping his preeminence, that prideful place, by trying to intimidate others. Well, I tell you this, if you're going to be her friend, then we're not friends no more. Come on. Oh, that's just children. Yeah, that's children learning a pattern for life if we don't help them. I tell you what, if, if, you're, going to, if you're going to hire him, then I'm out of here. You better be careful. I would say many, many a great business has been busted up over this. Two people God probably brought together, man going well, doing well, successful. And then, after, by the way, usually they don't have many pride issues when you first get started. It's when the success comes. And then all of a sudden, issues get in there. Diotrophies love it to have the preeminence. He starts thinking he ain't going to get it. Listen now. You might not be having a problem with this right now, but we all get it. We all get it. And all of a sudden, one says, well, if that's where you're going to be, I'd be better off by myself. Sometimes they are, but many times they're not. Many times they never do as well when that one breaks apart. And if we're honest, it broke apart over, what's the word? Say it. Brother David, you go ahead and come to the piano. Aren't you glad I didn't accidentally say come to the altar on this message? Praise God. Controls influence with intimidation. See, these are not things that we readily want to admit in our heart. Nobody wants to say, boy, listen, there, <laughs> there'll be nobody today, and that's fine. Come up and say, preacher, that was exactly what I needed. I'm the most prideful dude you've ever met in your life. Thanks for that. Uh, these messages don't get those. That's all right. I don't expect them. And this is the kind of thing that we don't want to admit is in our heart. You know why we don't want to admit this is in our heart? Because of... Right. We just can't imagine that I could be like that. But listen, I can be like that. And you can be like that. And listen, your precious little child can be like that. It's not always the other ones. Look at me. It's not always the other children. Sometimes it's yours that has the pride. 
We've got to watch this thing. It is a killer. It is a marriage destroyer. It is a friendship destroyer. It is a church destroyer. It is a business destroyer. It is a nation destroyer. Read through history. The nations come, they grow, and they get powerful, and they get financially blessed. And then what happens? They get proud, and they fall apart. And God breathes and plants America, and God blesses America, and America becomes financially strong, and America becomes militarily strong, and God puts her, His hand all over her. And then she realizes one of these days, we don't need God anymore. You know why? Because of pride. It's a destroyer, man. If you see yourself in this man's life, man, just ask the Lord to help you. So here's what I think we need to do. Since I don't think any of us would really want to just come forward as if to admit we're struggling with this right now, let's take the pressure off and pray preventatively this morning. Why don't we come to the altar this morning and ask God to keep our hearts free from pride? Why don't some of you just come right now and say, God, protect me from it. Protect my home from it. Protect my business from it. Protect our church from it. Pride destroys parents and children relationships, splits churches, ruins good businesses, destroys marriages, hurts people. If you're here today and you've never been saved, can I say to you, pride has kept many people from coming to Jesus. And they've died and went to hell. Because they didn't want anybody to think bad of them, they wouldn't come. Because they didn't even think they were bad enough to go to hell, which by the way, we all are. You are. I am. Because they just couldn't conceive that God would send anybody like them to hell. And He won't send you, but He'll let you choose to go. If you're here today and you don't know for sure that you're saved, you ought to get saved. I wouldn't let what anybody thinks of me keep me from going to heaven. You know, there have been many a backslider who has not come forward when God dealt with their heart because of pride. Because they was worried about what people would think and what people would say. And if I go forward, they're going to think I have to do this and they're going to think I better start doing that. Listen, why don't you just say, Lord, it don't matter what anybody thinks as long as you're pleased. Let's all stand with our heads bowed. Some are on the altar. Brother David's going to sing. You've been very patient. Thank you for that. I know it's warm in here. Nobody looking around. I wonder if there's anybody here you'd say, Preacher, I'm not sure if I died today that I'd go to heaven. His bow and eyes closed. If I died today, I'm not sure I'm saved. Anybody slip your hand up and say, That's me, preacher. I, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever been saved or not. I'm a little embarrassed to raise my hand, but I don't want to let pride keep me from admitting it this morning. Anybody in the balcony, I'm not sure I'm saved. Anybody on the main floor, I'm not sure I'm saved. Who would say this, preacher, I'm away from the Lord. I know it in my heart. I'm trying a little bit, but first thing I need to do is just be willing to admit.